Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Anna Kirchman, and I'm professor of history in the history department. Welcome to the university hour featuring poetry of Dr. John Guzlowski. Today's program was co-sponsored by the Department of History, Department of English, and the Intercultural Center. The program will go till about 3.50, because I know that some of you have classes to both teach and be in uh, the, at around 4. Uh, but if you want to stay a little bit longer, we'll have some time to chat with Dr. Kozlowski. And there are some refreshments at the table right behind you. And at the other table in the back, uh, there are some, um, excuse me, th there are two seats that are reserved here. Ah, OK. Um, and uh, on the other table, we have uh, some copies of books of poetry of Dr. Guzlowski that will be available for purchase too if you are interested. Now, I don't want to take too much time. I want to s leave as much time as possible to hear the poetry, but uh, I would like to introduce our today's speaker to you a little bit. Uh, born in a refugee camp after World War II, refugee camp in Germany, John Kozlowski came with his family to the United States as a displaced person in 1951. His parents had been Polish slave laborers in Nazi Germany. Growing up in the immigrant and refugee neighborhoods around Humboldt Park in Chicago, he met hardware store clerks with Auschwitz tattoos on their wrists, Polish cavalry officers who still mourned for their dead comrades and women who had walked from Siberia to Iran to escape the Russians. His poetry, fiction, and essays try to remember these people and their voices. But his poems mostly remember his own parents who survived their slave labor experiences in Nazi Germany. A number of poems about his parents and others appear in his books Language of the Mules, Lightning and the Ashes, and Third Winter of, uh, Third Winter of War, Buchenwald. Nobel laureate Czesław Miłosz, reviewing the Polish translation of Language of Mules, um, said, this volume astonished me. John Kuzlowski has done presentations about his parents and their experiences at the Polish Embassy in Washington, D.C., the Polish Museum of America, the Polish Mission at Orchard Lake, Michigan, Yale University, G Georgetown University, American University, and a number of other universities and colleges, uh, both in the U.S. and abroad. His awards include Polish American Historical Association's Creative Arts Award, American Council for Polish Culture's Cultural Achievement Award, and the Illinois Arts Council's Award for Poetry. He has also been shortlisted for the Bakeless Award and Eric Heffer Award, I don't know whether I'm pronouncing it right, and nominated for the Pulitzer Prize, and I know I'm pronouncing this one right, and for Pushcart Prizes. Uh, Guzlowski's poems and stories have appeared in nationally recognized literary journals and anthologies. He was the featured poet in the 2007 edition of Spoon River Poetry Review, and Garrison Keillor read Guzlowski's poem, What My Father Believed, on his radio program, The Writer's Almanac. Dr. Guzlowski's critical essays on contemporary um, American, Polish, and Jewish authors appeared in many uh, journals. A professor emeritus at Eastern Illinois University, John Kuzlowski currently lives in Danville, Virginia, where he recently completed a novel about the German soldiers who murdered his mother's family during the Second World War. He also keeps a blog about his parents' experience it, uh, experiences as Polish slave laborers and is a founder of and a member of active literary groups, uh, including Facebook-based Polish-American writers and editors. Now, I have known John Kozlowski for about 10 years, um, and I found his poetry very deeply moving. It really captivates a mind, a heart, and a spirit, and confronts you and challenges you to confront the most difficult aspects of life. Um, one of those kind of... Um, links that I found between my emotions and John Kozlowski's poetry is the fact that my father also was a prisoner of a concentration camp during World War II in Poland. And uh, um, 
I don't think that any family can actually um, live outside of those experiences. Um, and I think that poetry of John Kozlowski uh, shows it um, uh, very, very clearly. But that's enough from me. Um, John Kozlowski. Thank, thank you, Anya, and uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, thank Eastern uh, Connecticut State University for inviting me here and uh, for the English department and the history department for uh, co-sponsoring my reading today. Um, I'm going to, I asked Anya what, um, who, who, who my, yeah, oh, okay, thank you. Uh, I asked Anya uh, who I would be speaking to today, and she said there would be uh, history majors and English majors. and. Uh, I'd like to, um, I've written some remarks about, uh, about history that I'd like to begin with, uh, and then I'll, I'll read the poems. Uh, it's uh, some remarks about history. When you read about history in the history books, it's all so clear. The numbers make it seem that way. Numbers, people say, don't lie. A thing begins on a certain date and it ends on another particular date. You see the beginning of a thing and the end of a thing. It all seems neat and clear, but it isn't really. The history books, for instance, tell you that World War II began on September 1st, 1939, when the Nazis invaded Poland from the east. And the same history books tell you that the war in Europe ended almost six years later on May 8, 1945, VE Day. My father, Jan Guzowski, was not a student of history. He never had any kind of formal ed education, never went to school, never could read much beyond what he could read out of a prayer book. But he knew history. He had lived through history. He was a teenager working on his uncle's farm in Poland when the Nazis invaded and turned his whole world upside down. I guess you can say my dad learned history from the ground up. He was captured by the Nazis in a roundup in 1940 and was taken to Germany. Like a lot of other Poles, he spent the next five years at hard labor in concentration and slave labor camps. But for him, the war didn't end when his camp was liberated sometime in the end of, 19, end of March 1945. And it didn't end on Victory in Europe Day, May 8, 1945. And it certainly didn't end when my family finally came to the U.S. as displaced persons in 1951. The war was always with him, and with my mother, Teresa Guzowski, too a woman who spent two years in the slave labor camps in Germany and before that had seen the women in her family raped and murdered by the Germans. The trauma of what she had seen never left her. When I was growing up, I could see it in her eyes and the way she held herself together. My parents carried with them the pain of war and its nightmare every day of their lives. In 1994, 42 years after the war ended, when my father was dying in a hospital in Sun City, Arizona, there were times when he was sure that the doctors and the nurses trying to comfort him were Nazi guards who were trying to take him to the ovens. There were also times when he couldn't recognize my mother and my sister and me. He thought we were Nazi guards also. In, 20, in 2005, toward the end of my mother's life, I told my mother I was going to be doing a poetry reading and that I would re be reading poems about her and about my father and their experiences in the war. And I asked her, I said, do you want me to say, tell the people in the audience anything? And she told me, tell them we weren't the only ones. She was afraid that the people listening to me read these poems would think that my mother and father were the only two people who were taken to these camps in uh, Nazi Germany. Uh, in fact, there were between 10 and 15 million people who were taken to these slave labor camps. The, uh, the Germans had no one to work in their factories or on their farms. And so what they did is, as they went into these countries, 
the conquered countries, they would take whole villages and sh put them on trains and ship them to uh, work in these uh, slave labor camps. My parents knew that the war had always been with them, teaching them the hard lessons, teaching them how to suffer grief and pain, how to be patient, how to live without hope or bread, how to survive what would kill a person in the normal course of life. The war taught them that war had no beginning and no end. Um, I'd like to read some poems. I'm going to read for about 30, 35 minutes, and then I'll take questions. And uh, you know, any kind of questions you have, I'd be happy to, uh, to address. Can you all hear me? Yeah, sounds OK back there? OK. Um, I'd write, like to read a poem called My Mother Was 19. And it's a poem about the, uh, the day that the Germans came into her, uh, into, into her home. Uh, she lived in a little village west of Lvov, Poland, in, uh, in eastern Poland. Uh, here's the poem. My mother was 19. Soldiers from nowhere came to my mom's farm, killed her sister Genya with their heels, shot my grandmother too. One time in the neck, then for kicks in the face lots of times. They saw my mother, they didn't care she was a virgin dressed in a blue dress with tiny white flowers. Raped her so she couldn't stand up, couldn't lie down, couldn't talk. They broke her teeth when they shoved her dress into her mouth. If they had had a camera, they would have taken her picture and sent it to her. That's the kind of men they were. Let me tell you, God doesn't give you any favors. He doesn't say, now you've seen this bad thing, and tomorrow you'll see some good thing, and when you see it, you'll be smiling. That's bullshit. Um, my, mother, my mother survived. Um, her mother, her mother didn't survive. Her sister didn't survive. Uh, sister's baby didn't survive. My mom survived. She was able. She was able somehow to get out of that. Uh, get out of that house that she was in, and she escaped into the woods uh, around her house. But a lot of the people, and a lot of the people from the village, had also tried to escape into the woods. Uh, but the soldiers surrounded the woods and just went through them and uh, picked people up and uh, put them. If they felt the people were strong enough to work in the slave labor camps, uh, they put them on a train and sent them, sent them to Germany. Uh, I, for a long time, my mom wouldn't talk about her experiences at all. Uh, I would ask my mother when I was a kid, I'd say, Mom, you know, tell, me, tell me how we got here. Tell me how we got, uh, got to America. Uh, you know, tell, me, tell me what it was like before you came here. And, uh, my mother would look at me, and she would just you know, she would wave her wave her hand, and she would wave me away, and she would the only thing she would ever say is, if they give you bread, you eat it; if they beat you, you run away; if you if they give you bread, you eat it; if they beat you, you run away. Uh, it's the only thing she would say for a long, long, long time. Uh, it, it wasn't until it wasn't until uh, almost the end of her life uh, when she was in her 80s that she was finally able to start talking about the things that happened. And, uh, and I, would go, I would go see her, and uh, she would say, take out, take out a legal pad, uh, write this down. And I would write down some of the things that uh, she would tell me. Uh, and I would ask her questions sometimes. And sometimes, sometimes, sometimes she, would, uh, she would answer my questions and sometimes she wouldn't answer my questions. She would look at me, uh, you know, I, was, I would be like 58 years old, <laughs> 60, six, almost 60 years old, uh, and my mother would look at me and she would say, you know, you're a grown man and a college professor, but there are things that happened to me that I can't tell you about. Uh, so there are, there were just things that happened to her that, uh, that I, 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 I would never know about it. Uh, one, of the th one of the things that she did tell me was about her, the grief, uh, the grief that she felt uh, uh, when, when she was taken, uh, taken by the Germans. Um, 
and when my mother told me this story, uh, I was surprised because my mother, as, as I was growing up, my mother was never the kind of person who would express any kind of emotion. Uh, if, if there was, she wouldn't express joy, she couldn't express or wouldn't express love, sadness, nothing. She was a very strong woman, but she was a strong woman who couldn't show, who couldn't show her emotions. We would sometimes get letters from Poland. Uh, this was back in the 1950s, and we had some family that survived the war and went back to Poland. And uh, she couldn't, she couldn't, we would say, Mom, what's it say in the letter? And she couldn't show us, she couldn't tell us what was in the letters. Because she knew that if she read these letters to us, she would start, she would start crying. And so sometimes what she would do is she would have these letters and she'd take the letters and she'd go into another room, close the door and read the letters. So when she told me the story about her grief when she was ta first taken, I was, I, was really sh I was really surprised. I was shocked uh, because grief was nothing, was, no was not an emotion that I, I had ever seen her express. I'll read you the poem, Grief. It's, it's about what happened the first, uh, you know, the first couple of weeks after uh, she was taken uh, and after seeing the things that had happened to her mom and her sister and her sister's baby. Excuse me. Grief. My mother cried for a week, first in the boxcars and then in the camps. Her friends said, Teresa, don't cry. The Germans will shoot you and leave you in the fields. But she couldn't stop. Even when she had no more tears, she cried. Cried the way a dog will gulp for air when it's choking on a stick or some bone it's dug up in a garden and swallowed. The woman in charge gave her a cold look and knocked her down with her fist like a man and then told her if she didn't stop crying, she would call the guard to stop her crying. But my mother couldn't stop. The howling was something loose in her. Nothing could stop. I want to read some poems about my dad. Um, my dad was uh, captured pretty much the same way. He was a farm boy living in uh, northeastern Poland, north of Poznań. And, uh, went into town uh, to get some, uh, get some rope one day. And uh, the Germans surrounded the town and uh, went through the town and, and picked out all of, the, all of the people who they felt would be strong enough to, uh, to work in the slave labor camps. Um, one of the things my dad liked to talk about, my dad always talked, uh, talked about what had happened to him, what his experiences were. Uh, my mother would never talk, my dad would always talk. Uh, and one of the things he was always talking about was how little food they had. Uh, uh, he was in Buchenwald concentration camp, and they had about 600 calories. They had about 600 calories of food a day. Uh, that's about the size of a Big Mac or a big bowl of oatmeal. And uh, I wrote a series of poems called "Hunger in the Labor Camps" about this. About the poems. The first poem I'm going to read from the sequence is called "What My Father Ate." My father ate what he couldn't eat, what his mother taught him not to, brown grass, small chips of wood, the dirt beneath his gray, dark fingernails. He ate the leaves off trees. He ate bark. He ate the flies that tormented the mules working in the fields. He ate what would kill a man in the normal course of his life. Leather buttons, cloth caps, anything small enough to get into his mouth. He ate roots, he ate newspaper. In his slow, clumsy hunger, he did what the birds did, picked for oats or corn or any kind of seed in the dry dung left by the cows. And when there was nothing to eat, he'd search the ground for pebbles 
and they would loosen his saliva and he would swallow that. And all the other men did the same. Uh, it's a, another one of the poems uh, about the hunger in the camps. When my dad was, when my dad was finally uh, uh, liberated, he weighed about 70 pounds. Anybody here weigh 70 pounds? Yeah. Uh, I've got, a, I've got a granddaughter, Lulu. She weighs, she weighs 45 pounds. Uh, she's about this tall. Yeah. Uh, I've, only, I've, only, I've given a, I think in all of the years I've spoken about my parents and read poems about them, I've only, I've only been in one situation where there were people who weighed 75 pounds. And that's when I, was, I did a presentation in a middle school in uh, central Virginia. And there were some sixth graders in the class. And there was, there was one sixth grader who weighed 75 pounds. The poem's called What a Starving Man Has. He has his skin. He has a thinness to his eyes no bread will ever redeem. He has no belly. And his long muscles stand out in relief as if they had been flayed. He is a bony mule with the hard eyes one sees in nightmares or in hell. And he dreams of cabbage and potatoes the way a young boy dreams of women's breasts. They come uncalled for, round and fevered like rain that will never stop. There is always the empty sea in his belly, rising, falling, and seeking land. And next to him, there's always another starving man who says, help me, brother, I am dying here. Uh, uh, my dad was in this camp, Buchenwald, uh, and there were about, about 40,000 people there. Uh, how many people live in stores? 12,000, yeah. Uh, you know, we live, right now we live in uh, Danville, Virginia, and they've got about 40,000 people there. And I, uh, when I talk to the uh, students in the schools, I say, well, you know, Buchenwald, the concentration camp, was about the size of Danville. Um, the, uh, my father said there were, my father was a man with no education, and, uh, but he said that, uh, that Buchenwald was his university. Uh, he said, uh, he met people from all, excuse me, he said that he met people from all around the world. Uh, growing up as a, as a child on this farm, you know, he, he never, you know, he, he saw Poles, but in this concentration camp, he saw people from, from every nation. Uh, the, first, the first African person my father saw, the first black person my father saw was in a concentration camp in Buchenwald. There were people from everywhere in this camp, 40,000 of them. And uh, every, every year, about, uh, about uh, one out of four would die. And they would die from hunger and, and from cruelty. Uh, my father told a story one time about how the, at midnight, and it was a midnight in the last January of the war, uh, and it was snowing, and it was, about, it was about 10 degrees outside, and the snow was coming out, coming down, and the guards the guards had all of this, emptied out this barracks building my father was in. And this barracks building was about the size of this room, and there were about 400 men who were sleeping in this room. And they emptied the thing out. And they had these men uh, line up to do uh, a roll call, and they lined them up in the snow. And the Germans, the, the soldiers had uh, lists of names, and they would start reading out the names. And they would read the names, they would go through the names, and you'd get to, through, to the end. And these men who were standing in the yard in this, going through this roll call, the prisoners, they were dressed in rags. It would, and it was snowing, and it was like really cold. And people would start falling to their knees. And the, the guards would get to the end of the list, and they would say, you know, I think we forgot Janusz. Or I think we forgot uh, Mazur. We think we've, and they would read through the list again. And then they'd read through the list again. And more men would fall to their knees. And then they would fall over. And they would read through the list again. And I said to my father, why did they do this? And he said, they were just having fun. You know, uh, he said, the cruelty. 
uh, one, time, one time my father complained about the food and uh, the guard took a schlock, a club, and uh, hit my father over the head. My father got up and he said, I don't care if you hit me, the food is, ter the food is terrible. I'm a starving man and, I, and, I, and this food is terrible. And the guard hit him again and my father got up again and the guard hit him again and kept hitting him until my father didn't get up. And my father finally woke woke up, he had become unconscious, and he finally woke up and he was blind in his right eye. And he, he, was never a, he was, never could see out of his eye after that, and he never could close his eye after that. Uh, when, when they uh, buried my father, we had an open coffin, and uh, they, had to, uh, they had to sew his eyes shut uh, so that it wouldn't be looking, looking at us. Uh, it's one of the, uh, the Hunger and the Labor Camps poems. It's called Among Sleeping Strangers. Uh, these guys, in the, the, they had, you know, it was a big, uh, these barracks that these people were in, big places like this, and there would be like four or five hundred people in the barrack, and these would sleep on shelves, so they would have shelves that would go from the bottom all the way up, and the, they would be about so high, so far apart, about 13 inches or so. Among sleeping strangers, the moon set early, and it grew darker and the men settled to sleep in the cold without blankets. Soon it would be spring, but it was still cold, and it was always cold at night. And they did what men always did at night when they were cold. They pressed their bodies together and looked for warmth the way a man who has nothing will look, expecting nothing and thankful to God for the little he finds. And the night was long as it always was, and some men crawled roughly across the others to reach an outside wall to relieve themselves. And some men started coughing, and the coughing entered the dreams of some of the other men, and they remembered the agony of their mothers and grandfathers dying of hunger or cholera, their lungs coughed up in blood-streaked phlegm. And some men dreamt that, excuse me, and some men dreamt down deeper again, and deeper against the cold, till they came somehow to that holy moment in the past when they were warm and full and loved. And the sun in those dreams rose early and set late, and the days were first full of church bells and the early spring flowers that stirred their lives. And in the morning, the men shook away from the cold bodies of their brothers and remembered everything they had lost, their wives and sisters, their lovers, their homes, their frozen fingers, their fathers, the soil they had been born on, the souls they had been born with. And then they crawled up out of the earth and gathered together to work in the dawn. Um, just, I'll, I'll read maybe three or four more poems. Uh, I'm going to read the, uh, the poem called The Germans, and it's, a, it's the last of these hunger poems uh, about what, what it was like uh, for my father in these camps. Um, my father spent four years in these camps, and you know, I think, I think about it now, and I think, well, four years, and it all ended with liberation. You know, finally, finally the Americans showed up and freed everybody. But that's my sense of it. Uh, you know, and I, and I try to think about what it must have been like for my father. And when he was in the middle of this thing, and for my mother, too, when she was in the middle of this thing, there was no beginning and no end to it. They figured it would just be this would be the life that they had until they, uh, until they died there in the camps. Um, it's a poem called The Germans. These men belong to the Germans the way a mule belonged to the Germans. And the Germans stood watching their hunger and then their deaths, watched them as if they were dead trees in the wind and waited for them to fall. And some of the men did. They sank to their knees like children begging forgiveness for sins they couldn't recall. Or they failed to rise when the others did and were left in the wet gray fields where the Germans watched them. And the Germans stood watching when the men who were still hungry came back and lifted the dead men and carried their thin bones to the barn. 
and buried them there before eating the soup that wouldn't have kept them alive. The Germans knew a starving man needed more than soup and more than bread, but still they stood and watched. Um, I'm going to read some a couple of poems about my mom and then a, a, a poem about my dad, and then I'll, I'll finish up and uh, take, some, take some questions. When my, um, when my mother first arrived in Germany, uh, it was November, and uh, it was snowing. And she got there, unfortunately, just in time for the, uh, the beet harvest. Uh, and she would tell stories about, about what that harvest was like. Uh, they had, the, Germ the, they, the Germans had these trucks, and the trucks came to this farm. And there were all of these girls from my mom's village in this truck, in, in these trucks. And they'd empty the trucks out and told these girls, that they needed to go out into the fields and pick the beets. Uh, the girls were, were dressed in what, what they had been uh, caught in. Uh, some of them had dresses on, some had coats, some of them had hats, some of them had gloves, some of them only had uh, uh, pajamas or thin dresses. Um, they weren't given any, any tools to dig these beets up. They were asked to, uh, to, to, pick the, to, to dig the beets out of the ground uh, uh, with their hands. And uh, I'm going to read you a poem called The Beats about that uh, first, first November when my mom was there in the slave labor camp picking beets. My mother tells me of the beets she dug up in Germany. They were endless redder than roses gone bad in an early frost, redder than a grown man's kidney or heart. The first beat she remembers, she was alone in the field, alone without her father or mother near, no sister even. They were all dead, left behind in Poland. The ground was wet and cold, but not soft, never soft. She ate the raw beet, even though she knew they would beat her. She says, sometimes she pretended she was deaf, stupid, crippled, or diseased with typhus or cholera, even with what the children called the French disease, anything to avoid the slap, the whip across her back, the leather fist in her face above her eye. If my mother could have given them her breasts to suck, her womb to penetrate, she would have just so they would not hurt her the way they hurt her sister and her mother and the baby. My mother wonders, what was her reward for living in such a world? It was not love or money. She wonders if God will remember her labors. She wonders if there is a God. Um, one of the, I think one of the the lasting effects of uh, my mom's experiences on her uh, was that it, it just stripped her of any faith she had in anything. Uh, she, didn't believe, she didn't believe in her own emotions. She didn't believe in other people. She didn't believe in political systems. She didn't believe in God. Uh, she was raised as a Catholic girl in Poland. Uh, but when she was dying, I asked her if she wanted me to call for a priest so that the priest could come and, and give her the last rites. And she said, she said, no priest has ever come back from heaven to tell us what's there. Uh, she had just lost all of her faith in, uh, in all of her faith. Uh, I wrote a poem that touches on this. It's called, What the War Taught Her. I know it's here someplace. Oh, excuse me.
Here it is. What the war taught her. My mother learned that sex is bad. Men are worthless. It is always cold, and there is never enough to eat. She learned that if you are stupid with your hands, you will not survive the winter, even if you survive the fall. She learned that only the young survive the camps. The old people are left in piles like worthless paper, and babies are scarce like chickens and bread. She learned that the world is a broken place where no birds sing, and even angels cannot bear the sorrows God gives them. She learned that you don't pray your enemies will not torment you, you only pray that they won't kill you. Uh, I'm going to read a poem about my dad. Uh, my dad had, it, 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 he, had uh, he had a faith that was strengthened by his, uh, his experiences. Um, you know, where my mother lost all of her faith, my dad seemed to, uh, to have a greater and greater faith. And I'm going to read a poem called What My Father Believed. What My Father Believed. He didn't know about the Rock of Ages, or bringing in the sheaves, or Jacob's Ladder, or gathering at the beautiful river that flows beneath the throne of God. He'd never heard of the Baltimore Catechism either, and he didn't know that the purpose of life was to love and honor and serve God. He'd been to the village church as a boy in Poland and knew he was Catholic because his mother and father were buried in a cemetery under wooden crosses. His sister Catherine was buried there too. The day their mother died, Catherine took to the kitchen corner where the stove sat and cried. She wouldn't eat or drink, just cried until she died there, died of a broken heart. She was three or four years old, my dad was five. What my dad knew about the nature of God and religion came from the sermons the priest told at mass, and this got mixed up with his own life. He knew living was hard and that even children are meant to suffer. Sometimes when he was drinking, he'd ask, didn't God send his own son here to suffer? My father learned, excuse me, my father believed we are here to lift logs that can't be lifted, to hammer steel nails so bent they crack when we hit them. In the slave labor camps in Germany, he'd seen men try to do the impossible and fail. He believed life is hard and you should help each other. If you see someone on a cross, his weight pulling him down and breaking his muscles, you should try to lift him, even if only for a minute, even though you know lifting won't save him. Yeah, that, that's it. Thank you. A conference in Krakow, Poland, at the university, and I decided to take the bus. It was 14 miles down to Auschwitz and Buchenwald, and I had read a good deal about this, and most of you know I'm very involved in peace and human rights, so I had read quite a bit about this, but two things really shocked me. One was that when I went in a room and there were pictures it was 1942, a people from all walks of life, all ages, and they came in in the spring, and they were dead in the fall and the winter. They lived one year, and there were their pictures. The other thing that shocked me was the machine-like mentality that you are aware of when you go around these areas. It's not just the hair, human hair used in blankets. It's everything they did was machine-like. And I think we need to think about that very much and how it's applied in different places in the world, this machine-like mentality.
That's all I have to say. Yeah, thank you. Um, it was it was machine like and it was machine like in a in a way, but boy, there was a real sense of cruelty about it also. Uh, my mother uh, my mother tells a story about a a woman who was brought to the camp she was in, and the woman uh, had a had a baby. Uh, the baby was born in in the slave labor camp, and the women in the camp there were just women in the camp. Uh, the women in the camp tried to keep the baby hidden. And I said to my mother, why did they try to keep it hidden? And she said, when, uh, when, the guards, when, the, when the women guards found the baby, they threw it up in the air and shot it. And, uh, and then the baby, and no one was allowed to pick it up. The baby just w was lying there until the, 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 the camp, they had uh, uh, people walking around you know, uh, cleaning stuff up, you know, garbage men. And the garbage men came and picked the baby up. Uh, it, there was just there was a level of cruelty that uh, was just uh, you know I, I I can't believe it I, I just don't understand it so that it was you know it's that machine like stuff but there was also just a uh, real real cruelty there um, yeah, uh, other questions or comments I'd be happy to hear any kind of question yeah yeah what, when and how what you know in fact I'm glad you asked that question because I've got a poem about that. Uh, I was going to read it, and I forgot all about it. Uh, it's, I asked my mother how they met. And if I can find the thing, I'm going to read it to you, OK? Uh, I asked my mother how, it, uh, how they met. It, this is in her voice, prose poem. My mother said, and this is the first time I'm reading this, so you're going to have to tell me what it sounds like, OK? I first saw him in front of the barracks. Your father was walking with six other men, a German soldier behind them, pushing at them with some kind of rifle. Your father wasn't how he is now. He was skinny then, like two shoelaces tied together. I wasn't such a, excuse me. I wasn't, I wasn't such a prize after three years in the camps either. When the Americans came, they weighed me and found I was less than 100 pounds. And what was I wearing? You want to know? Woolens on my legs, a gray rag to hide my hair, a striped dress. And him, your father, like I said, skinny with a bleeding towel across his face from where he, where he lost his eye. Still, your father walked up to me. Excuse me. Took my hand. Still, your father walked up to me, took my hand, and said in Polish, Proszę Pani. Yes, he said, please, miss. And like a proper gentleman, he clicked his heels. I thought he was at least a count, maybe a prince. Then just before your dad had a chance to kiss my hand, the German behind him kicked him in the pants and said, Dumkopf raus. Get moving, dummy. Your father was like that, always putting on airs, even there in the camps, talking of Polish honor as if he and Poland shared a soul. Really, he was worthless. I wish he had left me there in the camps. He couldn't drive a car. He couldn't fix a leak. When I asked him in the refugee camp to help me pack to come to America, he took a little drink and bundled all the clothes together in a bedspread like America was across the street. The fool, I should have kicked him like the German soldier did. Instead, I kissed him and wept. Um, that's how they met. <laughs> um, she, and you know, it's, I've written an essay about this someplace uh, because I've got, you know, I'm. I'm hearing two different stories. I'm hearing my mom's stories, and I'm hearing my dad's stories. So my, I asked my dad also, uh, when he was still alive, I said, well, how did you meet? And my dad, you know, my dad's story was, was very, very different. Uh, uh, one of the things I remember my dad saying, you know, these are, these are people, when they, the, my, when, they, when they finally met in the camps, 
my dad was on a death march. Uh, he had been in Buchenwald, which is on the, in the eastern side of uh, Germany, and the Russians were coming. And so uh, the, the guards, a lot of the guards were trying to, the German guards were trying to get away from uh, the Russians. And they, they had these lines of prisoners who they were just marching. And they were hoping that these prisoners would either die or run away or whatever. And uh, they came up to my mom's camp, where my mom's camp was. And, uh, I said to my dad, what happened then? He said, well, the guards, the guards ran away. When they saw that there were the, the guards from the, your mom's camp had run away, they ran away too. And I said, what happened then? And my dad said, first we all found something to eat and then we got married. Uh, yeah. And uh, you know, I think about that, you know, a statement like that and what that means. These are, you know, uh, these were men and women who had seen you know, just absolutely terrible things done to their families. And uh, you know, in the camps themselves, there was, there was, so, little, there was so little human kindness. Most of, most of what they met from other people was, uh, was cruelty. And so the, they, you know, my mom, my dad seeing each other, these prisoners seeing each other, they must have thought, you know, this is a, this is a chance to re-experience a human touch. And, uh, and that, that touch, it must have been, you know, it, it must have been, uh, you know, it must have been something, yeah. There was a question right here. Yeah. I found that some of your poems are so, so powerful because it, it almost makes us feel like we were there. Yeah. We're there. Yeah. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and how that's going to work. So my question is, did your parents know who you were? Yeah. It's, it's, boy, I wish I had time to tell you. The, uh, it was, my parents, my mother, my father never learned to read, read English. My mother was able to read English. I mean, they lived in America. Uh, they came in 1951. My mother was able to re read English a little bit, uh, but never enough uh, to, to read a poem uh, or, or a book of poems. And so I was writing these poems and, you know, I would say, mom, hey mom, dad, you know, I wrote a poem. Here's, here's some, here's some poems. And he would say, yeah, yeah, yeah. It all changed, uh, after my dad died. Uh, in 2002, I had a bilingual edition of my poems, Polish English edition of my poems published. And I said to my mom, uh, I said, mom, now you can read my poems. And, uh, they're in Polish. And my mom, Looked at the first poem. She read a poem. I remember this so clearly. She read a poem called "Cattle Train to Magdeburg," about it was, which was based on my dad's story of, of how she got from her village in eastern Poland to Germany on this uh, on these trains and these boxcars. And uh, and I said to my I said, "Mom, here's you know." And she, my mom's reading this poem about how she made this trip and how she saw the river Vistula and the Warta. And she passed through the smoke-haunted ruins of Warsaw. And she read this, and she said, that's not the way it was at all. And I said, what was it like? And my mom said, well, let me tell you what, was, what it was like. And I got a piece of paper out, and I wrote down everything she said. And uh, let me read it to you. OK, this is my mother. You know, what, for me, for me what's, what's really important in these poems, uh, and I say this without shame, is that, uh, is that my, I can hear my parents' voices in these poems. And uh, for me, the best poems are the ones where my parents say the most, you know, where, my, where there's so much of my parents talking. And this poem here is so much my mother. Uh, it's called My Mother Reads My Poem, uh, Cattle Train to Magdeburg. It's the first poem in the book. She looks at me and says, that's not how it was. I couldn't see anything except when they stopped the boxcars and, the, and opened the doors. I didn't see any of those rivers, and if I did, I didn't know their names. No one said, look, look, this river is the Varta, and there, that's the Vistula. What I remember is the bodies being pushed out. Sometimes women would kick them out with their feet. Now it sounds terrible. You think we are bad women, but we weren't. We are girls taken from homes alone. Some had seen terrible things done to their families. Even though you're a grown man and a teacher, we saw things I don't want to tell you about. Uh, and you know what? Uh, you know what she described. I I didn't put it in a poem. 
<laughs> don't ask me why. I didn't put it in the poem, but what uh, she describes is this. These were, these were girls 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 years old. Some of them uh, recently married. Some of them were carrying uh, babies, you know. They were pregnant in these boxcars. It took days, days for these trains to get there. Hundreds of girls, 200 girls in these small spaces. Some of them gave birth to babies, uh, 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 stillborn babies in these uh, things. There was no way they could keep these babies alive. They were all squished into this boxcar. And these girls had to, had to, had to pass their babies out of these boxcars. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm writing a poem about my mother, you know, going through going through uh, Poland and this, doing a sort of uh, scenery, describing the scenery. My mother says, you know, it wasn't about the scenery; it was about what was the things that were happening to us, these terrible things that were happening to us. It's, I, you know, it, I've got a close-up shop here, uh, but. Thank you. Thank you.